So should we start? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's my pleasure to present the speaker for today. So Jean-Philippe Grobi. So he's a director of research uh, in the CNRS. He's working here in Loom. And he has been working a lot in acoustic metamaterials. And today he will talk to us about Willis couplings in acoustics. So Jean-Philippe, go. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Vassos, for this nice introduction. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, talk. Uh, this is a joint talk with Mathieu Malejac, who uh, Theo Cavalieri, both of them run some uh, experiments and verify my calculations. Comme Olivier, who runs some uh, experiments. Gaël Poignon, who taught me thermoacoustics, and this was a tough job. And among all the other people, I would like to thank Jensen Lee, who got the nicest idea of this talk, which relies, I would say, simply on the approximation of uh, matrix exponential. So today I will speak about Willis couplings in one-dimensional and quasi one-dimensional acoustic systems. I won't dive into the theory of Willis materials, but rather my goal is to uh, derive closed form expressions in elementary uh, uh, structures of Willis couplings in order to analyze the system, but also to eventually um, analyze the specific features of these systems. So the rationale behind this talk is the following. In acoustics, there are several structures which turns out to be asymmetric. So for example, these structures which were used to achieve perfect absorption in transmission problem. Well, you can see that this structure is composed of detuned Helmholtz resonator along the depths of the structure. This structure, which is quite famous because it was used to, sorry, uh, to evidence uh, negative refraction and the unit cell of which is composed of a plate and a hole. So the unit cell is completely asymmetric. Or for example, this uh, work where the author studied PT symmetric systems. In the early 80s, Willis was studying the, uh, the elastic response of asymmetric laminates. And he found out that to correctly model the response, so this means to correctly at, uh, be able to evaluate the different reflection coefficient from both sides of, of these asymmetric laminates, additional parameters have to be accounted for. Since this article, Willis couplings have uh, known a renewed of interest because uh, these additional parameters offer an additional way to control acoustic waves in materials when compared to metamaterials, which doesn't possess these additional param parameters. And in this talk, I will get a lot of inspiration from this uh, article. Okay, so the governing equation in Willis materials, assuming this time Fourier convention, takes this form where we recover the usual equations that describe the acoustic wave propagation in a fluid, where, which re uh, relates the first order spatial derivative of pressure and velocity to velocity and pressure via. via the density and the compressibility, which is nothing but the inverse of the bulk modulus, but also which relates the first order spatial derivative of the pressure to the pressure and the first order spatial derivative to the velocity to the velocity via two parameters, which are the Willis couplings. These two parameters will couple the kinetic and potential energies in these equations and takes the following form where we have a parameter which appears with a, ne a negative or opposite sign, which is related to the asymmetry of the structure. 
but also a parameter which appear with the same sign, which is related to the possible non-reciprocity of the structure because it turns out that Willis couplings are able to model asymmetric or non-reciprocal structures. Right, so, so these equations can be cast in the following form where we have introduced the state vector formed by the pressure and the velocity. And we have this matrix A, which I call propagation matrix, and the solution of which, which relates the state vector at X equal capital L and X equals zero via the exponential of this matrix A multiplied by the distance L. This exponential of the matrix A multiplied by L is nothing but the usual transfer matrix, right? So this is the case in an asymmetric and non-reciprocal one-dimensional one acoustic system. When the system is reciprocal, the propagation matrix reduces to this one, and the solution is exactly the same. Both state vectors are related via the exponential of the matrix A multiplied by the distance L. One thing we have to notice here is that this asymmetric Willis coupling is of first second order in frequency. This means that this is usually a linear function in frequency because an acoustic an asymmetric system falls back to symmetric at low frequency. So they appear at when we will derive a second order Taylor expansion, eventually, in terms of frequency. Finally, for symmetric and reciprocal system, the propagation matrix reduces to this one, which is valid to the second order in frequency for symmetric and reciprocal structure, but which is valid only to the first order in frequency for asymmetric structure. Right? Okay. So whatever the system we will uh, consider, either asymmetric, symmetric, reciprocal, or non-reciprocal, the solution takes this form. Now, if we assume <clears throat> a one-dimensional asymmetric and non-reciprocal system composed of a periodic repetition of period D of a unit cell, whose reflective, uh, respective propagation matrix is A sub E, the state vectors on both sides of the unit cell, so at x equal z and x equal zero, are related to a, via a transfer matrix, which is nothing but the exponential of the propagation matrix A sub E multiplied by the period. Among the 19 obvious ways you can find in this article to evaluate the exponential of a matrix, you can have, you can find the Padé approximation, which reads in this way. Inverting the Padé approximation, you can end with an expression of A sub E in terms of the elements of the, the transfer matrix, capital T, which, is, which are here, small t, which reads this way. From here, you can directly identify the, the Willis coupling, which is related to the asymmetry, T11 minus T22, that which is related to the non-reciprocity, possibly, which is equal to determinant of T minus one. Obviously, when the, the system is symmetric, determinant of T being one, this cancel. The effective density and the effective compressibility. Now, if we have an asymmetric and reciprocal system, as I initially said, we can directly impose the fact that determinant of T equals one and identify the elements of the propagation matrix. I initially said that we can impose the fact that determinant of T equals one, but this can be also used to validate the Taylor expansion and to assume some dependence on some elements uh, when deriving the uh, closed form expressions. We will see an example later on. Finally, when the, symmetry is, when the system is symmetric and reciprocal, 
we directly end with the effective density and the effective compressibility. So we made use of this first order Fadi approximation to derive closed form expressions of willis kuflings effective density and effective compressibility. And we validated the results either with, experiment, with an experimental validation. Simply, if we measure R plus and R minus on both sides of the system together with the transmission coefficients, we can directly recover three parameters, which are the density compressibility and the asymmetric Willis coupling. And in case of non-reciprocal systems, when we have R plus, R minus, T plus, and T minus, we can recover four parameters, which are the following. We have also validated the closed form expressions we will derive by directly inverting this expression, because if we have the transfer matrix, directly considering the logarithm of this transfer matrix will provide this element. We, and this procedure turns out to be a numerical procedure of that described in this paper. Okay, so the outline of my talk is the following. First, I will consider the closed form expression of the effective properties in asymmetric one-dimensional resonant acoustic systems. Then I will investigate the possible non-locality of Willis couplings in quasi-dimensional uh, acoustic systems. And finally, I will investigate a specific system, which is a thermoacoustic thermoacoustic amplifier, which is non-reciprocal and asymmetric. So first, closed form expression in one dimensional resonant acoustic systems. I will consider these three elementary systems. The first one is the, the, uh, the unit cell of the first one, sorry, is composed of two detuned resonators. The unit cell of the second one is composed of two detuned clump plates. And the third one, the, in the third case, sorry, the unit cell is composed of a clump plate and an Elmholtz resonator. So these are kind of elementary elements uh, which, can, which are usually encountered in acoustic metamaterials. So to derive the effective properties, we need elementary transfer matrices. So in S cross-sectional area duct of length L, the, way, the state vector at x equal L is related to that at x equal zero via this usual transfer matrix, where I have introduced Z bar and C bar and rho bar because I consider the flow which is nothing but the, sec the cross-sectional area multiplied by the velocity instead of the velocity. When we consider elements in parallel to the duct, here in this example, an Elmholtz resonator which loads a duct, the transfer matrix reads in this way because we have continuity of pressure and continuity of the flow, but we have part of flow which is pulsed by the Elmholtz resonator. So this uh, account for the impedance of the Elmholtz resonator, where, which reads in this way, referring to this article. OK, and finally, when we have impedance in series, we have continuity of the flux and a pressure drop, which is accounted for via the impedance here in that case of a clamp plate, which reads in this way in case of a circular clamp plate uh, in a circular duct. OK, so now we have all the elements to derive the effective properties. So in the first case, where the unit cell is composed of two detuned Elmos resonator, the total transfer matrix is that is the multiplication of the matrix of the transfer matrix, uh, which uh, models the propagation along the length L1, first Elmos resonator, then propagation along L2, then the second Elmos resonator, then propagation along L3. 
So we apply the procedure I described before, and we end with these closed form expressions. The first two are valid to the first or second order in frequency. The density is the effective density is that in the duct, while the compressibility is modified by the presence of the Helmholtz resonator. And obviously, we know since this article that the compressibility can be negative close to the resonances of the Helmholtz resonator. Particularly, we derive this asymmetric Willis coupling, which looks this way where we have kind of momentum which are introduced, which are related to the position of the Helmholtz resonator. When the unit cell is uh, turned to be symmetric, this uh, Willis coupling vanishes. But behind that, one thing I would like to point out is the fact that to be able to derive these effective properties, we have to assume that one over the impedance of the Helmholtz resonator is first order in frequency. In other words, varies linearly in frequency, which is definitely not the case. For example, in the absence of losses at low frequency, one over the impedance reads in this way, where we have one over omega and here a Lorentzian. So this is known as codynamic regime. But this is a strong assumption, let's say, and obviously close to the resonance of the Helmholtz resonator, we may encounter some problems. But by the way, we validated experimentally these uh, effective properties. So, so here the asymmetric Willis coupling, the uh, bulk modulus, the normalized effective density, and here, are the two reflection coefficients in blue and in purple. So both of them are different, particularly in between the two resonance frequency and the transmission coefficient. Right. So now let's move to the case of two detuned plates. So in that case, we simply re uh, replace the transmission, uh, the transfer matrices associated to the Helmholtz resonator, but by those. Uh, modeling the clamp plates. And we end up with these effective properties. So the compressibility is not affected by the presence of the plates. The density is affected by the presence of the plates, as can be assumed from this article. And it can be negative close to the resonant frequencies of the plates. And we again exhibit a Willis coupling at the second order in frequency, which reads in this way. And again, we have kind of arm term, which are related to the position of the plates. Again, when we make this unit cell symmetric, this vanishes. And again, and this assumption is even stronger than in the case of Helmholtz resonator. Zp here as is assumed to vary like omega, which is definitely not the case because, for example, at very low frequency, it varies like one over omega. By the way, we have again verified the uh, effective properties. So we list coupling compre effective comp uh, bulk modulus and effective density. The effective density is effectively uh, the real part of the effective density is effectively negative below the resonant frequency of the first plate. The reflection coefficients are different when we excite the structure from one side or from the other, and the transmission coefficient is the same. Okay, so these are, I would say, classical asymmetry, which are simply related to detuning of resonant frequencies. So now let's move to the third case, whose unit cell is composed of a clamp plate and an Helmholtz resonator. So the, trans, uh, the total transfer matrix is a multiplication of these five transfer matrices, and we end up with these effective properties. So compressibility is modified by the presence of the Helmholtz resonator. 
the density is modified by the presence of the clamp plates, and we derive a Willis coupling, which is composed, roughly speaking, of a term which is exactly that related to the presence of the Helmholtz resonator we saw previously, one which is related to the presence of the clamp plates we saw previously, but an additional term here, which kind of represents uh, the fact that this unit cell can hardly be symmetric. And obviously, it's not symmetric. So in that case, making the Willis coupling vanish is very hard, not to say impossible, because the unit cell is intrinsically, intrinsically asymmetric. We have validated again these effective properties. The reflection coefficients are effectively different when we excite from the side with which when the wave encountered first the Helmholtz resonator or when the wave encountered first the clamp plates. And we effectively exhibit a negative wave number at the frequency band where both the effective bulk modulus and densities are negative. Right, so we have derived the closed form expression of the effective properties of several elementary resonant acoustic systems. We have also shown that the asymmetric Willis coupling is exhibited at the second order in frequencies, in frequency, sorry, and that different types of couplings are evidence depending on the asymmetry. And then I strongly insist on that. When you have a structure which can obviously not be symmetric, the Willis coupling cannot be avoided. Okay. So let's move on to the first part of my talk, which is related to the possible non-locality of Willis coupling. And to analyze that, I was thinking to a very simple example. And I end up with a fluid laminate. Okay. So the idea behind that is to analyze whether the effective properties in uh, this configuration may depend on the wave number or not. So to do that, I was uh, uh, influenced by this article, but also by the chapter which was written by Denis Lafarge in this book, which is specially dedicated on non-local dynamics in fluid saturated metamaterials. So the configuration I will study takes this form. So first, I will assume a Willis medium, a plate com uh, composed of a Willis medium. So in that case, the possible Willis couplings take the form of, a vector, of vectors. I also assume, because it was kind of funnier, that the medium is, can be asymmetric. It can be, sorry, anisotropic. So the density is a matrix and uh, the di principal direction of them match the direction of the plates. Quite classical, classically to solve this problem, I operate a special Fourier transform in the plane X1 and X2 of these two equations, introducing these tilde uh, unknowns and the wave vector uh, the, the state vectors are related so the sorry again the first order spatial derivative along the extra free direction of the state vector is related to the state vector via this propagation matrix here which is composed of the third component of the Willis couplings the third component of the density and an apparent component, which depend on the compressibility, the density along X1 and X2 direction, and the possible Willis couplings along the X, uh, the X1 and X2 direction. Here, I insist that 
the green parameters, which are supposed to be the parameters describing the material, doesn't depend on the wave numbers. But we introduce an apparent compressibility for simplicity, which depend on the wave number, but the parameters of the material doesn't depend on the wave number, right? So this uh, system, because it looks like the propagation in a one-dimensional system is usually called quasi one-dimensional system. And the solution of which relates the set vector at X equal L capital L to X equals zero via the exponential of this propagation matrix multiplied by the length, the thickness, sorry, of the plate. Okay, so now if we assume a reciprocal and asymmetric system composed of d periodic repetition of a unit cell whose propagation matrix is AE. We, I just remind you the procedure we, I described you in the introduction. We end up with this effective propagation matrix where we have the apparent compressibility, the component of the density along the third direction, and we exhibit the, these two terms, which are of opposite side. Right. So now I will specify the fact that my layer is composed of a periodic repetition of a two layer medium. So the period is D along the X3 direction. And this D is composed of a layer. Uh, of anisotropic fluid of lengths L1 and L2. So the total transfer matrix is the multiplication of the transfer matrix over the distance L1 and L2. I end up with this, effect, uh, this parameter of AE and more importantly, from these elements, we can derive the following effective parameters where we find out the usual mixture law for the third components for, for the components of along X3 of the density, the compressibility one over the density along X1 and X2, which are classical from the, let's say, first order homogenization theory. And we end up with the following terms where we, uh, where you can see that both Willis couplings along X1 and X2 are zero. This can be expected because there is no asymmetry along X1 and X2 direction. And a Willis coupling, which depend on K1 and K2, which are nothing but the projection of the wave number along the direction X1 and X2. So this means that this Willis coupling is composed of a local part, but also a non-local part. So we have seen that in that case, the Willis coupling appears with an opposite sign in the diagonal of the propagation matrix, that this Willis coupling appears as a sum of a local term and a non-local term. But this imposes that the governing equations I initially wrote were in, were in fact wrong, and they may uh, be written with a convolution product in the in-plane space in that way. Alternatively, it also it may suggest that the form in 2D or 3D, because we match the results of uh, Taylor expansion, making use of Pade approximation, to a form of equation. So this may indicate that the form we match with is not the correct one in 2D or in 3D. These uh, effective parameters have been uh, have been um, validated against the Baker-Campbell uh, Osdorff formula, and I lie to you, uh, and I will explain you why. So, in fact, I doesn't lie, but there is something uh, strange which appears when you derive that. Obviously, along x1 and x2, there is no asymmetry. So. C1 and C2 
are, are zero. But let us assume that we are in a case where they are not zero. We have seen before that they vary, at the, uh, that, they are, that they linearly vary with frequency. Here, CA, when I run the Taylor expansion, I end up with an expression which is first order in frequency. So this is constant, this is constant, constant, this is first order. So this term, from this term, I can eventually end up with the fact that C1 is of opposite side of zeta1. But these two terms are of second order in frequency. So rigorously, without assumption, and with the method I derived, I cannot say that these two terms are zero. Right. Nevertheless, we have validated this time numerically the results in case of two, uh, laminates composed of two orthotropic porous layers whose unit cells are shown here. Here are the normalized uh, density along the X3 direction, real and imaginary parts. The Willis couplings along the X3 direction and the apparent bulk modulus for two different angles of incidence. So you can clearly see that both are different and that the non-local term in the Willis coupling cannot be avoided. Now, if we look at the scattering coefficients, R plus R minus NT, here I have also plotted the, uh, the scattering coefficients when calculated with the first order homogenization, so when the Willis couplings are avoided. And you can see that quite rapidly, the first order homogenization deviates from the results because you, it cannot be used to model the asymmetric structure, while the, Willis, the results calculated with the Willis couplings follow the exact results till um, high frequency. This can be expected, obviously, because Willis couplings appear, are appeared at the second order in frequency, while the first order homogenization is, is only at the first order in frequency. Another result is the following. So where I have uh, separated the local term in continuous line and from the non-local term in dashed line, and you can see that at high frequency, the non-local term is more or less of the same amplitude as the non-local term. Similarly, the scattering coefficients are well recovered for a secure uh, unit cell. So basically, what we have shown here is that the Willis couplings allows to widen the frequency range of validity and accuracy of the, scat of the calculated scattering coefficients, and that the non-local term if the Willis material formulation is correct in 2D or 3D, uh, cannot be avoided in this type of structures. Well, I will now move to the third part of my talk, which is related to the non-reciprocity and asymmetry in thermoacoustic amplifiers. So, the rationale behind that is no, the non-reciprocity, which relies on the fact that, well, not relies, but when you have uh, when you swap a source on, on a receiver in the medium or on both sides of a non-reciprocal medium, the signal will be different. In other words, you end up with transmission coefficients, which are different. In acoustics, you have three ways to achieve non-reciprocity. Either you consider spatial temporal dependent material properties, or you can combine nonlinear properties with asymmetry, or you can introduce an external bias. In here, I will consider a specific bias, which is the thermoacoustic effect, which uh, is concerned with the thermal exchange between an acoustic wave and a boundary. This bias has some has advantages for when compared, for example, to flow, because they can be applied locally, while when you uh, introduce flow in a system, you have flow everywhere. 
So the question is, can we model a thermoacoustic amplifier as a Willis material? Obviously, the answer is yes. But what is a thermoacoustic amplifier? So this is a unit cell of a thermoacoustic amplifier. It composed of, is composed of a straight duct where you insert a porous material with large and straight pores, which is customarily called the slack, stack, sorry. And on both sides of the stack, you introduce honeycomb, which are nothing but porous materials with straight pores, and the size of which are even larger than those of the stack. So basically, it's almost air. Then you can apply a hot temperature and man maintain an ambient temperature at both honeycomb locations in order to create a temperature gradient along the stack, but also along the thermal buffer tube. So in the end, the unit cell is composed of five elements, which can be repeated along the duct. To model the acoustic wave propagation in presence of a temperature gradient, we make use of the results of the modeling of this chapter where in the absence of temperature gradient, this equation falls back to those modeling the acoustic wave propagation in the vesco-thermal fluid. But the presence of the temperature gradient couples the flow to the first order spatial derivative of the flow. So intuitively, we can directly uh, uh, infer that this system will exhibit Willis couplings. One thing which has to be uh, noted is that because of the temperature gradients, all the parameters here highlighted in green, depending on the temperature, they also depend on X. So the, to solve this system, we introduce the state vector composed of the pressure and flow velocity, and again, a propagation matrix where the effective density and effective compressibility depend on X, but we have also the presence of an additional term, which is a thermoacoustic amplification or attenuation depending on the, its sign and which de also depend on X. So the solution of this type of system, which allows you to relate the state vector at X equal L to the state vector at X equals zero, uh, takes the form of a matricant, which is the which is evaluated via the Peano series expansion. This Peano series expansion is usually evaluated iteratively, and it takes me a lot of time to understand that each iteration corresponds a kind of higher order Taylor expansion in terms of KL, but also in terms of G bar L. So in particular, the first order expansion, which is this one, takes this form and is valid till K bar L square and G bar L square. We can easily verify that this matricant is not that of a reciprocal system, because if we, if we evaluate the determinants of this matricant, it's reads this way, which is different from one in the presence of temperature gradient. Okay. So now when the temperature is constant, the transfer matrix is the usual one, which reads this way, and its first order Taylor expansion reads this way. From that, we can relate the state vector on both sides of the unit cell, x equals zero and x equals d by multiplying the transfer matrices or the matricants and evaluate the total transfer matrix. Again, from the total transfer matrix, we can derive the effective properties of the uh, via the PADE approximation by identifying each terms. And we end up with these terms, with these effective properties, which calls for several comments. First, all the effective parameters are impacted by the non-reciprocal terms, these non-reciprocal terms being represented by G2 and G4 here. 
as you can see here from the denominator. Second, the effective density and effective compressibility exhibit different cumulative impacts in terms of the uh, first order special derivative temperature in particular. This uh, a temperature gradient impacts the following density terms while it impacts the former compressibility terms. This is because a thermoacoustic amplifier acts more as a flow amplifier like as a flow source. Second, when G2 and G4 are both zero, the, effect, the Willis couplings are zero. But more importantly, Willis couplings are of equal amplitude but opposite sign, and they are exhibited at the first order in frequency. So this means that the asymmetry is kind of uh, appears like a kind of counter reaction to the non reciprocity. And finally, and you can, as you can see here, both Willis couplings are almost purely imaginary, notably at low frequency. And from that, we expect some particular behavior at low frequency. <coughs> so we have validated these effective properties experimentally and numerically. In the absence of temperature gradient, both Willis couplings are zero. When we increase the temperature gradient, Willis couplings are not zero anymore. They are almost purely imaginary. All effective parameters are affected. And you can see that the non-reciprocal Willis couplings is of a, uh, same amplitude but opposite sign with respect to that to the asymmetric Willis coupling. This is valid till a temperature gradient, which in that case was around 100 uh, degrees. This is because the expressions are valid till uh, are only uh, second order in terms of G bar and G bar L. So weak temperature gradient. In terms of scattering properties, T plus and R plus versus frequency in the direction where we expect amplification, T plus and R minus in the direction where we expect attenuation. So in the, in the absence of temperature gradients, both are T plus and T minus and R plus and R minus. are almost one because the structure is almost air. Obviously, R plus and R minus are almost zero. And here I have also depicted the real and imaginary parts of the dispersion relation of the waves going that way and that way. So I increase the temperature gradient. You can see that T plus is larger than one, while T minus is much lower than, not much, but lower than one. T plus equals one when the imaginary parts of K plus, so the wave going that way, equals zero. And you can see from the dispersion relation that the dispersion relation is deformed. And in particular, we have something at very low frequency which appear, which strongly looks like a band gap, but it cannot be a band gap because waves going in the plus direction doesn't have the good sign of the imaginary part because there is amplification. So I have decided to call this band amplification gap. And both wave number coalesce to a ZGV point, which is not at the uh, for which doesn't appear for real part of KED equals zero. And this is for 100 degrees difference. Okay, so we have seen that <clears throat> uh, the temperature gradient open uh, an amplification band gap and that we have a ZGV point, which is exhibited for a specific temperature gradient. We have validated 
these results for a larger uh, structure composed of the rep 15 repetitions of the unit cell. Basically, we, we exhibit the same uh, the, the same tendency, but the fact that uh, T plus is larger than it was in the case of one unit cell and T minus is smaller than in the case of one unit cell. So we have seen yeah, that in this kind of system, Willis couplings are exhibited at the first order in frequency and that the asymmetric Willis coupling appears like a counter reaction as to the uh, non-reciprocal Willis coupling. Uh, we can infer that the condition determinant of T equals zero can be very particular, but also highly promising in the design of some systems. And it can be interesting to investigate Willis couplings in other non-reciprocal systems. So this is my the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe, for this very detailed uh, talk. Uh, does anyone have question?